Thank you very much, um, Usman, and thank you, uh, Nagib. Uh, can you all hear me quite clearly, wherever you are? Can you hear me yes, clearly? Please. Yes, we yes. can hear you. Well, I want to begin by uh, thanking uh, Nagib Guncharya for arranging for the uh, republication of this work. And he did mention that we actually have a new uh, cover for the book. The original cover was very plain. This one is a cartoon uh, because it reflects um, one of the new literary media since the Rushdifia 30 years ago. You know, the cartoon controversies consumed a whole decade of the 21st century, beginning with the, uh, the Danish uh, 2006, I believe. So roughly, you know, a, a decade onwards, uh, from the, the Hebdo uh, assassinations, plus events that continue now, as you mentioned, Usman. Uh, so I wanted to thank uh, Nagib and the team at BJAC for presenting this work in a beautiful way. Let me just briefly say how difficult it was to publish this work, because, and I mentioned this in the preface, originally when I went on television to give my opinions in defense of Islam and to explain to people what the issues were, people said to me all the time, the same thing. They said, you Muslims want to kill Mr. Salman Rushdie because you don't know how to argue with him. And I said, well, that's not true. We do know how to argue with him. And in fact, if we had the access, the privileged access that Mr. Rushdie has to publishing houses and newspaper articles, we would, but how would you allow me, I said, to write something in The Guardian? And they were a bit taken aback by the request because up to that point in 1989, the spokesmanship for the Islamic cause, for it or against it, was always in the mouths of secular liberal intellectuals, sometimes of Islamic background, but they had absolutely no interest in Islam and despised Islam. You know, people like um, Tariq Ali, for example, Hanif Quraysh and other writers had Muslim names, indeed extremely pious names. Salman Rushdie is a very pious name. Unlike my name, by the way, it sounds quite secular, in fact. Um, so I said, look, would you allow us to go on television? And that's actually how it all began. That I was given access to a number of newspapers and a television live. And that's when people realized that we did have a case against him. I said, look, I don't, I don't deny the fact that there are Muslims who are inarticulate and who may want to simply kill him or harm him. But there are people among us who have read the book. Uh, contrary to what Mr. Rushdie was saying, that nobody had ever read the book. I said, no, there are people who read the book including the late uh, Sayyid Ali Ashraf at Cambridge, uh, may God bless him. Uh, he was a professor of English literature. I said, we have read it, but we don't have the access to be able to express our opinions. And I'd like to have that chance. So to be fair to the media and to a number of intellectuals, such as the Canadian uh, intellectual who was at Cambridge at the time, Michael Ignatieff, we did actually, we were given a chance, a limited chance, what I call a statistical veto which means that for every uh, one strong Muslim voice like mine, they had to publish 20 responses to me, one to 20, which is very flattering. It implies that I was as good as 20 secular intellectuals, one Muslim versus 20, very flattering ratio. Uh, so in other words, it took a long time to, for our case to be presented in the media uh, because remember, it was the secularists who had the privileged access. And I suspect this is probably true in France today, it's less true in England today, today, to be fair. I mean, we do have distinguished scholars like uh, Dr. Ziauddin Sadar, who's uh, in Malaysia now. He managed to get access to The Guardian uh, at a later stage, post Rishti, to be able to do a, a blog on the Quran and to explain to people what the Quran was actually saying, as opposed to some of the mis misapprehensions and misconceptions about it. So those are the early days. In terms of the publishing history of the book and why it's called what it is called, let me explain that. Um, it's actually to do with the proverb in Persian, which says, basically, you may say whatever you like about God, but be careful with Muhammad. And it was a motto that was taken very seriously by Christian missionaries who were working in Persia, in India, and other lands of the Muslims. Because what it really means is that while God is no monopoly of Muslims, it's Jews and Christians equally annex him to their cause and claim to believe in him, perhaps the same God, um, although, of course, it may be questioned because of the Trinitarian nature of Christianity. But the point is that unlike someone like Moses, who, by the way, is revered by all three of these religions, 
the Prophet of Islam is revered only by the Muslims. He is rejected by Jews and Christians officially because he comes later chronologically. On the other hand, the Quran, of course, honors the prophets of its two previous monotheisms. So we Muslims, for example, in response to the attacks on our prophet, cannot go and start attacking Jesus Christ or Moses, the people of previous faith. We're not allowed to do that. So that was the point of the caution. Be careful, Muhammad means he's our beloved. He's our monopoly. He's the one that we are obliged to offend. So this leads me to another question, which is where I tried my best to respect the consciences of my secular humanist and liberal critics. In other words, I didn't dismiss that they had a case. The point of the book is that we have here a clash between two unnegotiable principles. People in France and Britain and in Europe in general may legitimately say that, look, we have acquired the, uh, the right to freedom of speech after many cultural battles and struggles particularly against the Catholic Church or other authorities. And we're not going to part with this extraordinarily hard-won liberty simply because a group of Muslims have arrived after the Second World War to fill our factories, uh, to do jobs that white people from England weren't willing to do, right? These people are basically backward historically in the eyes of the, in the West, and they're trying to reimpose the kind of religious tyranny it took us thousands of years to escape from, meaning the tyranny of the churches and their attempt to... Um, uh, censor literature. So that was the that was the context in which this was this was actually happening. But I wanted to explain to them that um, we weren't necessarily opposed to the exercise of liberty of speech and expression, but there are legal limits to it. And my appeal was, can we alter the law? Basically, I was a bit naive in this thinking because I thought it's a minor request. They'll say no problem. We'll amend the blasphemy law, which already covers. Uh, the Anglican denomination of the Christian faith. Remember, the blasphemy law, except in Northern Ireland, did not cover Roman Catholicism. It only protected Anglican sensibilities in the mainland of the United Kingdom. So I thought it was a simple request because I was unaware of the niceties of, of the English legal system. And of course, I didn't know about the processes of parliamentary democracy, how this might take time. Well, as it happens, of course, as you know, and I mentioned this in the long preface that uh, Nagib mentioned, the uh, the uh, the blasphemy law in the in, in England and Wales has been abolished for about a dozen years now, and everything is now under public disorder. Meaning, if someone makes comments which are so provocative that they uh, lead to public disorder, then he may be prosecuted under this uh, public disorder act. In other words, everything now is under human rights and secular legislation on race. The sensibilities of all religions have been removed in English law recently. And in fact, England was one of the few countries in, the, in Europe that had a, an official blasphemy law because don't forget, England has an established church. Even though it's a very secular country, it has an Anglican church. Unlike, say, France, which, uh, unless I'm mistaken, despite the efforts of um, um, one of the kings during the Crusades, I think it was uh, Philip IV, there's no uh, Church of France. Am I right about that? There's no Church of France. It's just the Roman Catholic Church. They don't, have a, they don't have a national church, unlike many Lutheran nations and, and, and certainly the United Kingdom. But I was mistaken because I was taken aback by the degree of cultural disrespect for the prophet. Not talking about law, talking about public decency. Don't forget the prophet Jesus, although he had been subject to vicious character assassinations by secularists, and Jesus and his mother have been desecrated. No question about that. But at a cultural level, there's respect for Jesus and his mother. Look at how many charities are named after Christian associations. Naturally, you know, for a continent that's been Christian for that long. Um, so there's cultural capital of respect and affection for the figure of Jesus. But there's no such cultural capital and respect for the figure of the prophet of Islam. We're not talking about law. We're talking about ordinary people's feelings and culture. When we mention the word Muhammad, Already the images are of violence and terrorism. Do we want to abet and aid that image by further writings like the one that Rushdie did or like the cartoons of the Hebdo, which are basically a character assassination of the founder of, of a major religion? I mean, think about it factually. Which founder, which any other religion is, is routinely maligned in that way? Is there anything on the Buddha, for example, comparable cartoons? Well, you might say there isn't, but then the Buddha wasn't the... Um, a, a leader, a general, if you like, a holy general, uh, and neither was Jesus. And, you know, he didn't uh, found an empire. All, all factually quite 
reasonable uh, objections. So let's argue the case, I was saying to the liberal establishment. One of the chapters of my book uh, is the liberal inquisition, where I compare the old inquisition <laughs> with, the, with the new version of it, where Europe is continuing on a war against Islam under a secular setting. Because of course, as you know, in practice, a lot of the Judeo-Christian stereotypes and prejudices, particularly Christian ones, uh, have simply been uh, transformed into secular analogs. Yeah, so people thought of the prophet in this derogatory way in the Middle Ages. Rushdie was actually trying to resurrect exactly those stereotypes by using secular language, because now we are permitted in literature for the last maybe 100 years, since D. H. Lawrence's work, Lady Chatley's Lover, we are permitted to use a relatively obscene and vulgar language. It's not censored, right? So basically, he was trying to he was trying to create a form of religious pornography in his literature, meaning use the same idioms and obscenities about the life of the Prophet of Islam and his wives, as he would use of any secular personage from history, and have absolute liberty to use four-letter words, which incidentally uh, 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 the publisher I in consultation in consultation felt needed to be removed with asterisks, which indicate what the word may be. But we, we felt in a, in a little preface uh, uh, note at the beginning, uh, we, we thought it would be wrong to um, include such obscenity to offend Muslims. Uh, but at the same time, by the same token, out of my respect for the secular humanist conscience, I did not add the devotional formula on the Prophet, peace be upon him, which actually is a requirement of Islamic etiquette because it's in the Quran. I asked the Muslim readers to mentally supply that expression whenever they saw the word Muhammad written without any such uh, uh, reverent um, benediction on his name. So I was trying my best to, to say to people on the other side, look, we would like to debate this as a matter of conscience. So you try to understand us and we should try to understand you, which is why actually Be Careful Muhammad became a book that was uh, widely read. It's a requirement actually for people in the House of Lords and, and Commons, the two uh, tiers of our parliament, because the Bishop of Manchester kindly asked them to see it as required reading, as background, when they're debating any possible legislation on, let's say, a public disorder act or the abolition of blasphemy. So that's actually the background to what happened. But just one more point about trying to get the work into print before I say what's in the book. When I was invited in the summer of 1989, at the height of the Rushdie affair, post the fatwa uh, and post the book burning, all of which took place in 1989. January 1989, Bradford book burning, and of course the book burning was within the law, uh, although provocative admittedly, culturally. Uh, and then the fatwa one month later on set Valentine's Day in 1989, which of course altered the power dynamics because now the head of a state was involved. And although it was a fatwa, meaning a legal opinion, a legal opinion issued by a head of state has got some power behind it, unlike a legal opinion issued by an unknown cleric, which is simply one opinion among others. But an opinion issued by someone who happens to be the head of an Islamic republic obviously carries weight, and people took it very seriously. And what actually then happened is the people then retrospectively interpreted the book burning as an act of desperation. They thought, ah, now we see why these people were upset and they were trying to make themselves heard. And I actually was present at the book burning and nobody from the London establishment uh, made the uh, decision to come and cover it. It was only covered locally. It was covered properly nationally only after the fatwa one month later. That shows you that it is power that counts, unfortunately, and not the power of the pen. And I say in my book that the, the pen is not mightier than the sword. The pen is mightiest with the sword, meaning when the arguments fail, you've got the drone attacks and the bombings from the French and the English, because they know that sometimes you need to back up your best arguments with a bit of force, right? And uh, so th it was a bit of irony and cynicism in that. And with regard to fatwa at the time, I did say, look, this is a, an external intervention. In, in, you know, as British citizens, obviously, we cannot uh, uh, implement it. But I also said to them that the idea of assassinating uh, someone in this way is perhaps unusual because of its frankness. I mean, the CIA and the British Secret Services regularly assassinate people, but they don't announce it. In fact, they deny it afterwards, say we didn't do it. So here was a man who was honestly saying, no, this, this is unacceptable to us. But what exactly was unacceptable? That's the point I wanted to make in my intellectual argument. And I made this point in the summer of 1989 in a debate with Hanif Qureshi, who's a famous secular writer, 
who actually was trained in um, uh, philosophy, uh, among other things, um, in the University of London, and is, in my view, uh, a very interesting and good writer of plays and novels. But unfortunately, I cannot agree with his stance on the Rishti affair. And I met him a few times, once privately and once uh, in a debate. Now, the debate was held by the Institute of Contemporary Art in London. It's a well-known venue, but it was a very abnormal debate because they had never had a, a committed Muslim speaker on any side in any theme defending or um, opposing. So it was an unusual affair where Mr. Anif Qureshi and I were debating the merits of free speech. Anif Qureshi is a passionate defender of uh, Salman Rushdie and is a friend of his. And I do not know Salman Rushdie personally. I had an offer to meet him privately but clandestinely, but I declined because I thought it would be very cynical if my uh, Muslim friends in Bradford Council of Mosque thought, well, he's campaigning with us against him and he's having supper with him in the evenings. I thought that would be an act of extreme cynicism. So I declined that offer. But I did stay through my um, context in the Independent and the Guardian, the papers who, who published me, that I'd be very happy to debate him publicly, of course, uh, on the merits, uh, so long as, of course, I could, felt concerned for his security and said, if they can um, make sure that uh, his security is guaranteed because the fatwa was there, then we can do that. I had the debate with, uh, with Hanif Qureshi, and here's something that was quite a shocking fact for me. Before the debate, the New Statesman Society, which is a liberal uh, magazine, had promised to publish a transcript of the debate. But after the debate was won by me, they refused to publish it. That's when I knew that there were double standards in freedom of speech, that it wasn't all about a principle. It was actually not about a principle, because if it were a matter of principle, then why should they publish the proceedings of that debate, whichever way it went? I mean, it just happened I won the debate. They took a vote from the audience, most of whom were hostile to me, incidentally, some of whom were actually related to Rushdie, like his sister, but they all felt that I'd made a decent case because I did not present an Islamic case against the book. I did not quote from Quran and Hadith, which I respect as absolute sources. I made a liberal argument for how we are to live together in a secular democracy as citizens who manage internal dissent so that it doesn't descend into fascism and into outright violence on the streets because of provocation. That was my case. I made it very carefully after reviewing the book in one of the chapters. So in other words, be careful, Muhammad, in my view, ironically, is the only liberal book on the Rushdie affair written by a Muslim who is actually very committed to his faith. That's the irony of it. And incidentally, that's the reason why the book was widely uh, published in ex excerpt form, meaning many newspapers uh, um, published large extracts from it and some books and anthologies published uh, the parts of it like chapter two on the um, the notion of the, 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 the place of literature and is literature sacred, one of the titles of Rushdie's essays. And the book was then used in schools to some extent and also by the Open University, which is a mature adult learning uh, university in the United Kingdom. They wanted to have uh, the, the right to publish parts of it. It's very interesting the parts they chose. One of the things they chose was an extremely short original preface where I mentioned an actual incident about a woman, probably a woman similar to my mother, illiterate, incapable of uh, reading, let alone of appreciating allegedly great literature. And this woman was very offended and troubled by what the secular teachers in her school were saying uh, about this is great literature. She didn't know how to respond. She knew there was something and not quite good about this book and why Muslims oppose it. And basically, when I heard about the incident, I wrote the book, as well as being a campaigner in my spare time, I wrote the book um, in my spare time to express that woman's, to articulate that woman's indignation uh, and to be able to say, look, those Muslims who, because they don't have command of English and of English literature, can't speak. This is me speaking on their behalf, giving them a voice, if you like, um, and I was at the time working in the race relations industry, employed by the Commission for Racial Equality. Uh, so eventually, of course, I had to resign my job because I couldn't work for the race relations industry, which is totally secular. And at the same time, in my spare time, be writing a book that was defending Islamic values. So because of that, I felt in good faith I should I should resign my my position. Indeed, I did do that. So the principle that were conflicting with these two. Um, the unnegotiable principle of freedom of speech, the Westerners said, and as I say, in some cases, they had uh, good grounds. They said, look, 
you know, we've won this liberty against religious fascism and authoritarianism, all true. But I reminded them that the, the law itself had limits on freedom of speech, as you well know, you know, racist speech is not allowed. There's such a thing as libel. Uh, the difference is, of course, that the person they're libeling is not physically alive, nor are his relatives, his wives, to take someone to court. But the Prophet Muhammad, of course, is not physically alive. He's ideologically very much alive, because he's mentioned uh, practically all the time somewhere on this planet. Just like the Quran is liturgically the most rehearsed scripture in human history. It's always being read by someone. And in its own original language of incidents, by the way, quite remarkable in Arabic, the Bible is, is a bestseller, but who reads it, one wonders. And I think that the Bible and the bestseller is very similar to the satanic verses in that many people have bought satanic verses, but almost nobody's read it, including his admirers. I challenge how many of Rushdie's admirers have read this very lengthy work. In fact, I used to joke, a joke that was censored by, by the television, that uh, see all the best jokes belong to the devil. They don't give a chance to God-fearing people to tell jokes. I said, well, anyone who reads this book by Rushdie beyond his 10th page, deserves the Booker Prize because it's an incoherent piece of trash. It takes much patience to get through it because mainly it's a list of obscenities, in fact, um, and a kind of a fantasized, myth mythologized history of real Islam uh, where everything has been altered, you know, to mock it. So the two principles were, for us, the unnegotiable honor of the Prophet for Muslims, and for them, the unnegotiable principle of freedom of speech. But the difficulty was that did the principle of free speech defenders have any consistent principled position? Principled position for a principle, meaning consistent position, not double standard. Like, for example, Holocaust denial is a crime in France, but it's okay to malign the Prophet of Islam. So where, where is the freedom of speech there? There are no single standards. These are double standards, indeed triple standards, because they have a different, uh, even more complicated system for artistic elite, who it seems are beyond the law. Uh, so that was the background. Uh, Faber and Faber, a very big publisher, actually were interested in me. But when they saw the book and they realized that if we publish the work, we will alienate Penguin and Rushdie's uh, uh, elite, they, they declined. So it had to be published by a relatively unknown, but non-Muslim publisher. I didn't want the book to be published by a Muslim publisher. Because then by, by definition, people would have said, well, it's a, a pious work. So I managed to find a small um, non-Muslim publisher, which as Naguib says, you know, unfortunately was not a commercially viable. Soon afterwards, uh, they weren't operating anymore. But the book had become relatively known. Uh, and indeed, to the extent that I was invited to uh, Malaysia by um, via the uh, good offices of Dr. Ziyad bin Sardar uh, to come and meet Anwar Ibrahim, uh, who was very much appreciative of Muslim intellectuals throughout the world. I mean, he said that, you know, if you ever need to come to Malaysia, you'll be honored here, we'd be very happy. Indeed, I did end up there. Uh, and so that's the background to the book, uh, two sets of negotiable principles. Just one PS before I maybe could look at some of the chapters of the work and what the preface is about. The PS is that um, it seems to me that in Europe, this affair of Rushdie and this affair of Charlie Hebdo now are to some extent motivated by unnegotiable principles, not mere differences, but principles, meaning there are principles involved on both sides, which is why it's a dilemma, which is why it's intractable and is arousing, arousing so much passion. So I would warn Muslims against being too cynical and saying, well, it's just, you know, it's just hatred and malice for us. There's nothing else. No, there is a principle involved, which is to do with the, the right to conscience, which is an old principle. And it has been one, particularly against the Catholic Church, because remember, in the Catholic tradition, uh, the right to conscience is to right is the right to believe in conscience in matters where you are right, not in matters where the ju the church judges that you may be wrong. That's a very crucial distinction. Um, in the religious setting, the Catholic Church's view was concerning heresy and inquisition that if you reject a doctrine and grounds of your individual private conscience, you may have that right even if it. Uh, seems that the belief you hold perhaps conflicts with ecclesiastical official dogma. That's a very different view from the secular version associated with Voltaire, that you have the right to your conscience no matter what the content of your belief, even if it's right or wrong. Your belief may be immoral. The Catholic Church didn't defend that. The Catholic Church said you have the right to your conscience if you're right, meaning you, what you believe is also correct. 
You don't have the right to your conscience if what you believe is untrue or immoral. But Voltaire and the secular lobby say, no, you have that right to believe in whatever you want to believe on grounds of conscience, even if others think you're wrong. Because remember, there's no absolute way of judging. The church will say, no, we know what's right and wrong. We know objectively because it's a god given authority. The secular lobby will say, well, let's have a bit of humility. In society, there may be conflicting denominations, both religious and secular. So let's just give every citizen the right to their own conscience. Whether you think it's right or wrong is a separate matter. That's fair enough. On the other hand, we do have a moral consensus in society that some things are absolutely wrong, no matter what someone thinks. For example, we don't think that psychopaths and pedophiles have the right to, to their conscience. We penalize them under the law. That was the point, right? That this conscience uh, right is actually uh, not as simple as it seems. We have to balance the rights of other people's consciences. And I encourage that view because, you know, Muslims are living in largely secular societies where I live, for example. So they should look at the history of the evolution of secular humanist principles about conscience and freedom and then try and negotiate, which was my suggestion, rather naively at the time, because actually it led in the opposite direction, um, which is why this debate continues today, because if the debate didn't have any principles involved on either side, I think it would have been resolved more pragmatically. But the fact that passions are aroused and people are willing to lay down their lives, including on the secular side, after all, people have paid a price there too, right? And Rushdie paid a price, uh, you know, for 10 years he lived with loss of liberty. That's a big price to pay. So I, I, would, I respect that and I encourage mutual uh, respect for that. But I accept that these principles are negotiable. And what I, what I say to both parties is, can we try to talk through our differences? Unfortunately, gratuitous and provocative acts like the Charlie Hebdo cartoons is a one-sided insult, meaning they're not interested in talking to people who disagree with them. They simply want to provoke them. And what happens then is, unfortunately, that from the other side, you get the reaction of, of violence. I mean, when the head of a state like Macron makes a statement that we're going to be basically attacking what he sees as radical Islam, uh, then um, basically it's an act of provocation. So while, of course, one doesn't condone uh, beheadings and killings, I would put the blame on the French secular policymakers who are too arrogant to see that we need to have a debate. And perhaps there should be a, a temporary ban on the cartoons to let people publicly debate this in a democracy and let's see what we can come up maybe some common ground. I have to say with, with considerable regret and disappointment that I've not seen the attitude at all. Uh, in England, I think uh, there was an informal agreement, basically. You know, this is a very English way of doing things. People don't announce the content of a principle. They simply, in practice, adopt it. So we haven't had the same tensions here with the Hebdo thing. Uh, people have privately bought the cartoons, exercised that right, but without necessarily making a public issue out of it. Um, in America, I have to say with the regret that I think that even during the Rushdie affair, no principle was involved. I see American society as being very different from European society on this point. I think in America, the immigrants who go there, go there in search of economic prosperity. They're not particularly motivated by their religious principles. This includes the Muslims, incidentally. And so there, there was no debate between two cultures, the host culture and the newly arrived uh, you know, Muslims. The Muslims were affluent background. They wanted a green card. They wanted to get on with their lives and become well off. They had no real interest in ideology and principles or uh, no real connection with the rest of the Ummah of Islam because physically and geographically, they were very distant. I've always noticed this very distinct difference. I lived in America for 10 years and taught in Virginia. The Muslims weren't very animated or disturbed by these types of ideological literary attacks. They thought it was uh, juvenile for us Muslims to react. We should just ignore it. And that we live in societies that give us a decent amount of rights, which is certainly true, including uh, religious liberty. Muslims can worship and build as many mosques as they like. Unlike, of course, the fact that Christian missions, and this is a very common Christian grievance, uh, feel they can't have the reciprocal rights in Saudi Arabia to build mosques. They don't have religious liberty. If some Muslim uh, decides to become a Christian, even in good conscience, then, of course, as you know, informally, there's vigilante violence. And officially, there's some dispute among scholars as to what the right penalty would be, depending on where you're located. I mean, if you're in England, for example, there are lots of well-known uh, atheists in England of Muslim background, and they lead perfectly prosperous lives. And by the way, they make a good living out of showing off that they're not Muslim on live TV. So it's obvious that nobody's trying to kill them. Um, because if they were, 
if there was incitement to murder those people and some, one or two of them had been killed, I'm sure they would be a bit more cautious about appearing on Good Morning, uh, Good Morning, uh, you know, TV shows where they openly, you know, say that uh, we are not Muslim and we think Islam is a retarded religion. So unfortunately, in the American case, I felt bitter disappointment that they did not take on the cause. And I suspect this book won't be very popular if it finds a distributor in, in America. So let me just take a, a, just a little a pause here, Usman, if you don't mind, to ask if there's any question, and then I'll continue for another maybe 15 minutes. Is that fair enough? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Thank you, Professor Rahtar, for that. Uh, but let us just uh, go to the uh, questions and see if, if there are any. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't show that there is any questions. Maybe there will be later. Uh, okay. Um, you you may continue if you if you like. Yes, yeah, please. sure, I can for another fifteen minutes or so. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's okay, good. great. Thanks. You know, you know, Osman, I could talk about this forever. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't actually talk about it forever because that would bore the audience. But I'm just saying that the topic is fresh in my mind because I've just been working on a major preface, which I'll tell you about. Well, how I've updated it, you know, as, as Nagib mentioned, a fifth of the book is entirely new, plus the cover is a cartoon, unlike the original. Yeah, so it's actually a completely new work. Um, in the preface, I tried to look at 30 years of what's been happening since in, in the aftermath of Rushdie. Uh, I, I was reluctant to make a career out of simply, you know, attending events to Salma Rushdie. I've got many other books to write, and, and you know, some of them are on very reflective uh, philosophical topics. The Quran, the secular mind, is about how a secular, fair-minded secular person, an atheist, would read the Quran, the entire Quran. So it's a very major philosophical treatise. And that's, of course, why I've been in Oxford the last uh, eight years. In other words, I'm judged not on my record as an activist, which is fee sabil Allah for the sake of God, my faith, but, you know, the committee that appointed me here judged me on the quality of my philosophical work which was looking at the philosophical tradition of Islam and trying to revive it. Uh, kind of a, a Islamic Renaissance front type idea that you know, philosophy should become part of our culture, which Naguib also mentioned with the Institute in, in Indonesia. In other words, the point is that we want to be uh, seen as a community of the pen, reflective community. Of course, sometimes it's necessary to defend yourself physically, self-defense, as I'm sure you know, Usman, from coming from the Balkans, there is a time where it helps to have some arms and ammunition when you're about to be the subject of a genocide, right? But in general, you know, we are a community of the pen, as the Quran, in fact, uh, the very first revelation of the Quran, which I pointed out in my book against Rishti, is that Islam is a religion of the pen par excellence. Which other revelation begins with a reference to the pen? Surah 96, right? And there's a whole surah of the Quran called the pen. Right, noon, Surah Noon or Surah Al Qalam. So we are a people of the pen. We have made major contributions to um, uh, scholarship and civilization. In fact, I say to the critics of Islam who object to Islam be, being an empowered, legitimately empowered religion, not a terrorist religion, but empowered by legitimate means. I say to them that when Muslims were in power for a good, you know, let's say half a millennium. What did they give the world when Muslims were secure in their military and physical power to some extent? They gave the world peace, stability, and scholarship. Right? Terrorism is a sign of weakness in a civilization. You never see billionaires hijacking airplanes or demonstrating on the streets. They don't need to. They've got power. They just pick up the phone. That's what we don't have, unfortunately. We don't have any influence intellectually. At the level of governments, we don't have you know, very few governments have any power. Like, for example, in the, in the case of the Bosnian genocide, there were individual militias who intervened to prevent the genocide. How come no Muslim nation did anything? That shows you that the level of nations, we don't have any say. And I make this point in the, in the book against Rushdie that contrary to what people think, Muslims are not an aggressive, um, power-hungry people. On the contrary, they are a wounded civilization, which is extremely weak, which is why people think that with impunity, they can insult them. Why don't people draw cartoons of Modi of India? He's a fascist in some of his policies. Why don't Charlie have to attack Indians? Hindu fascism, why is it always Islamic fundamentalism they're attacking? Even if it's a legitimate target in some cases, right? My point is that we are a wounded, vulnerable civilization. That's the truth. But the problem is our image is that we are a very powerful, 
aggressive civilization threatening Europe, which is far from true. Okay, so in the preface, I look at a couple of um, you know popular issues to do with Islamophobia. Let's take a couple of issues of this. Um, in the debate on demography of Europe, which is a big debate dear to the hearts of many right wingers, they say, they quote uh, sensationalist data such as, "Did you know every third male born in the continent of Europe is called Muhammad?" Okay, let's suppose that were true. Yeah. Okay, so it may be a matter for concern, but could it not also be interpreted to mean that Muslims, uh, perhaps for religious reasons, have to name first male child as Muhammad, or perhaps even more commonly, they're simply lazy and unimaginative. My parents called me Shabir, they didn't call me Muhammad. Right? I'm saying we don't have a variety of male names because we prefer to name our first child with that name. That may indicate that the name is an indication of popularity in Islamic culture rather than as an indication of absolute numbers statistically, that there's loads of Muhammads walking around, meaning millions and billions of them, and they're going to soon, soon overtake us. So in terms of the interpretation of demographic, demographic statistics, right-wing sensationalists can always misinterpret them to cause alarm in the population. Did you know every second male child's name Muhammad could be misinterpreted to mean that 50% of all male births are Muslim? That's not true. Actually, that's not true. Right. Another thing, look at the number of mosques that are being built is also cited as a criterion um, of Muslim uh, expansionism, um, non-physical colonialism, if you like, of the European continent. Okay, what is the what is the proliferation of mosques in England, for example? I speak from experience, and in France. Again, I speak from experience. Um, what does it really indicate? It actually indicates not that there's an absolute rise in the number of Muslim worshippers and jihadis, which is the popular fantasy of the Western imagination. What it actually indicates is that Muslims are passionately sectarian and they love to be divided. They're always hostile to each other. Where I live in Oxford, we had a major mosque built with you know the money given from ordinary working class Pakistanis, taxi drivers, hotel owners, etc. People who are devout enough to say we need our own mosque. Wonderful, spectacularly nice mosque. What happens when other communities who came before them or after them were not happy with such a thing? They had their own mosques. The Bangladeshis said, no, we don't like Pakistanis. We find them racist. Um, during the war for independence, 1971, 73, uh, they, you know, they basically are brothers, but no longer. Now they are enemies. East Pakistan is Bangladesh, by the way. It was part of Pakistan. I come from West Pakistan. Um, Arab brothers and sisters, who many of whom are, some of whom are my students, in fact, but certainly all of whom are in the University of Oxford, they said, no, we don't feel comfortable with Pakistani style of worship. I said, well, what, what is it that you feel uncomfortable? They said, well, after the prayer, you know, they start chanting and singing and saying how much they love the Prophet. And we, we find that somewhat idolatrous. We, we're uncomfortable. And moreover, they're singing in their own language. We don't know what they're saying. We don't really like the sound of it. We're going to hire a hall on Friday for the Juma prayer. See the sectarianism? Now, of course, the enemies of Islam don't know the inside story. They say, look, Oxford used to have two mosques. Now it's got seven mosques. I'm saying that's an indication of the weakness of Islam, not its strength. Because if they were actually strong and united, they'd have one big mosque. For God's sake, the one big mosque is mainly empty. Now it's completely empty because of the COVID. Before, they, it was mainly empty. You know, only maybe half of it was filled with people because it's a very big mosque. So do you see my point, uh, Usman? That I, I want to interpret the same data in a completely different way. And I would be happy to be challenged by your audience if they think that, you know, I'm misinterpreting it. Uh, so that's the other cause. In the preface, which is extremely long, I look at both the history of my personal struggles where I'm invited to university debates and uh, sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. Yeah, just very briefly, if I can mention that aspect of my work. Um, there was actually only one debate I've won in the last 20 years to do with the freedom of speech and Islam and its uh, relationship with secularism. And that was with my, my colleague, Professor Tariq al uh, We were on the same side of a panel in Cambridge University three years ago, and we actually won. Um, which is very strange when you think about it, because, you know, the audience would have been relatively secular, and uh, we won against Douglas Murray, who is an extremist um, uh, right-wing uh, um, racist, in fact, upper class, uh, who was mainly incensed 
and angered by Islamic official views on homosexuality. Uh, and he may have other reasons too. I mean, he, he, he has double standards. When he's in England, he, he does criticize Muslim views, which is perfectly right. But when he's in Holland, he's openly abusive and calls for the repatriation of Muslim migrants back to their country of origin. So same person saying completely different things, double talk. And he accuses Tariq Ramadan of double talk, and yet he himself practices it as well. Uh, I had a debate in the York University that was aborted at the last minute. There was some opposition to me being there. Uh, I had a successful debate at Exeter University, which I lost. It was against uh, a group of fanatically pro rushdie people. And by the way, that debate was held one month before the Charlie Hebdo assassinations of January 2015. It was held in Christmas of 2014. So you can see how this issue is still alive and well. And uh, as far as the rise of Islamophobia is concerned, within my own community, I have been accused, along with others, of course, I'm not the only uh, leader by any means. In fact, I was an intellectual sort of voice. The leaders were different and were all friends and brothers and sisters of mine in Bradford. We've been personally accused of taking a wrong turn 30 years ago. And at the Al Mahdi Institute, the Shiite Institute, someone said to me privately that it was our own fault. We, by standing up to Rushdie, we encouraged Islamophobia and even 9-11. I mean, uh, absurd and sensationalist claims, of course, right? Because who knows what lies hidden in the womb of history? We couldn't have known that. And even if we had known that, I still think it was a matter of principle, unnegotiable, that you should defend the nobility and honor of our prophet. And I'm going to end on that note, Usman. But as I say, I'm very happy to elaborate. There's so many other things I've not mentioned. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's a very lengthy work in terms of the preface. And now when you add it to the originally somewhat uh, concise work published 30 years ago, now the book is almost um, just under 200 pages. So it's a substantial, uh, I've removed some errors, factual ones uh, in, the, uh, in the original text, obviously, but I've left the rest as a chronicle of actual events and me as a campaigner. Um, in the preface, I concentrate on some uh, heavy duty philosophical arguments against the absolute nature of liberty of speech. I question the view that a principle simply in virtue of being a principle is defensible. Does it not matter also what is inside the principle? I mean, there are many men of integrity and consistency who are evil. I mean, Hitler's principles were all very consistent, but the whole totality was wrong. So let's not be so seduced by the idea that so-and-so is a man of principle. Charlie Hebdo are people of principle. Yes, but what are the principles they're defending? What if their content is immoral, which is that it is a noble ambition to mock people who are already despised. I wonder if that's such a morally good thing to do. Thank you, Professor uh, Akhtar. Thank you yeah. so much for your uh, elaborate uh, presentation. You, if I may start the yeah. debate and then we'll, we'll have some questions line up. You mentioned Douglas Murray in the case you won against him. Uh, the debate you went against him or was it the, the actual um, legal what, what case? The, no, it was a debate at the Cambridge Union our Cambridge, yeah, we have two, yeah, Oxford Union, Cambridge. At the Cambridge Union, the Professor Tariq Ramadan and I were invited to defend the motion that Islam is a religion which can live in secular liberal society quite comfortably, meaning by respecting. Well, we are European Muslims, as Professor Tariq said. Right? I agree with him. In other words, we can learn to live quite peacefully in the house of. Um, uh, let's say, I wouldn't call it hard, it's the house of covenant, it's the house of doubt, perhaps, you know, Britain is a secular culture. We defended that view, me and Taik Ramadan. Uh, Douglas Murray and his Dutch allies, they were the, one of the ministers from the Dutch government was there, said that no, Islam is totally incompatible in every form, whether it's liberal progressive Islam or radical Islam. Well, radical Islam obviously is incompatible if it outlaws homosexuality, for example, openly. They were saying that Islam uh, is... Uh, a uh, religion that's incompatible with secular Western values. And that the reason why Tariq Ramadan and Shabir Akhtar 
are arguing the way they are is because they're duplicitous, they're liars, they're hypocrites. They're showing the good face of Islam. They're not discussing the decapitations of the ISIS people, or for that matter, what happened in Paris, uh, you know, uh, just uh, in the last 24 hours. And we were trying to say that, look, you know, Islam, like any other religion, has different strands of conviction, different settings. I mean, if your country is under occupation, you have every right to self-defense. That involves violence. But if you're living as law-abiding citizens and the country in which you're living, like my country of citizenship is the United Kingdom, my parents chose it for me, I come from Pakistan, is a country that respects uh, the moral and legal principles of freedom. Why should I be unhappy? I'm perfectly happy. Here. Of course, I'm not happy with British foreign policy. That's where the dilemma arises. I, I mean, ever since I was a child growing up in this country, you know, as, the, as a child of working class parents, I do not remember a single day when I didn't wake up to the news that Britain was in direct or in proxy war with some Islamic nation, whether it was in, uh, helping India to you know, get rid of East Pakistan, make it Bangladesh, whether it was Mrs. Thatcher bombing Libya, whether it was the Gulf War, you know, I've always lived through that. So in other words, the question of divided loyalties arises uh, among Muslim citizens in the United Kingdom and the West, and people are surprised by this divided loyalty. They shouldn't be. If British foreign policy is constantly attacking Islamic nations, and I belong to that Ummah, just imagine if Britain invaded Israel, wouldn't British Jews be in a dilemma? whether to support England or to Israel. But they're neither in that dilemma because this never happened. If Britain invited India, wouldn't Hindu uh, and Indian migrants? The problem is the Muslims are first put under these conditions where their loyalty is being tested. And then they're blamed when they choose uh, on grounds of conscience to identify with the sufferings of Muslims worldwide, mm -hmm. like Kashmir, for example, in the case of my birthday.